Up next, we have Lubna Sherry, and she's discussing the secret truth of war. 16 years old, Lubna currently represents Australia and India at UWC, USA. Through her involvement with Camden Youth Council, Youth Action NSW, the Australian National Youth Sexual Health Control, NSW Youth Parliament, as a youth ambassador for NSW Commission for Young People and Children, and with the daily conversations with fellow students from around the world, she has seen first-hand power of creating a better world navigated by constructive intent and negotiation to create better opportunities for all. Our world teaches us about achieving peace throughout conflict. Yet our wars are the most bloodiest and brutal events in human history. Our teachers explain to us about the significance of the sacrifice from men from centuries before who fought for our peace. But they also choose to not mention the casualties imposed by such soldiers. Our government pledged millions in military support, but they ignore the silent plight of thousands of innocents affected by such force. And that is the secret truth of war. From the moment our childhood begins, we are taught that victory can only be achieved by defeating the enemy, by crushing them. And this is simply through our favorite game of rock, paper, scissors. Let me explain. Rock crushes scissors, scissors cuts paper, and paper smokes rock. We know that, right? But the issues here can transcend the childhood world and into the arena of politics and war. One must always be the bigger and powerful. There is a strategy to kill, and there is an advantage in force. But what happens when two sides are evenly matched? They draw, and then they fight again and again until one defeats the other. But why stop there? Why not stop at the draw? And this just leads to more questions. Why do we call those who refuse to engage in armed conflict the defectors, the pacifists, cowards? And why do we call those who kill the opponent our heroes? It comes down to the root of our societal beliefs. We entrust badges and medal of honor on those who protect us in the act of violence against a presumed future attack. This also leads to the idea of a global battlefield. The idea that the West is at war with, with the world, that democracy is at risk, and that drones, surveillance, and military support are necessary to combat this threat. After the fatal attacks of September 11th in 2011, 2001, sorry, President George W. Bush said that the U.S. was fighting a war, but not on the typical battlefield. He said that the enemy was ignoring the borders, and thus the U.S. should act accordingly. The U.S. then began its invasion of Iraq in March 2003. It lasted over seven years, caused over 500,000 casualties, and cost more than a trillion dollars, just for the agenda of protection against weapons of mass destruction and justice for 9-11. But recently, Experts and theories have come up saying that the U.S. only entered to secure oil. But this conflict, it seeks to show how just how widespread in our world it is for one country to enter another just for its own interests. It leads along the line, this self-interest leads to this idea of collateral damage. Collater collateral damage is the unintended injury or death of a bystander caused by a military operation. Far too many times in war is collateral damage occurring and presented to us tally as numbers. This collateral damage, these innocent men, women, and children are far more than numbers. And we need to remember that. And it also leads to this idea that we, we tend to look at war simply as facts and figures of artillery, weapons, soldiers, and land, and so on. And we refuse to see the real picture. War is the defeat of humanity. It corrupts us and plays on our fears and insecurities. When we send our troops away to war, what are we sending them away for? The answer that may pop into your mind, protection, prevent terrorism, to defeat a bad guy, tend to be fueled by our national, nationalism and our self-interest. We think that sending away our troops is protecting our homes and our way of life. And we, thus we assess our soldiers as our heroes, these brave men. But see, the, both sides of a conflict have this mindset. 
that their soldiers are simply doing what is right. So who do we blame? Do we blame the soldier who picks up the rifle, points it in between the enemy's eyes and pulls the trigger? Do we blame the pilot who pushes down the red button during an airstrike? See, again, this is what they've been employed and contracted to do. They are given orders to kill. Orders given by the men and women in grey suits and white collars. Their leaders. Our governments. So even if a soldier believes that it is morally wrong to shoot another person, it is their job. They have to do it. So we could blame our government, our military generals, and even the public for accepting and approving these orders. It's because we accept them, we approve them, we don't even question them, that they have become so ingrained into our culture and into violence across the world. So, um, I do understand though that the world is a dark place. That I'm just 16, I haven't seen much of the world. I do understand that there are people who are in positions of a pow power who abuse that power and pose as a risk to civilians. And so, I do see the need for war. But ideally, war should be conducted with a just war theory, which is a theory that has six principles. One, it should be undertaken with the intention of preserving peace. Two, it must be offensive. Three, it must be enacted by a established governing authority. Four, it must be protecting civilians against violence. Five, it must be it must have a good chance of success. And six, it must be used as a last resort. If a war can meet these six criteria, then it could be considered morally justified. And to be honest, I feel even guilty for saying that. Because no matter how you put it, violence is violence. And we can't justify it. Whether we are mur murdering a ruthless dictator, a soldier in khaki, or an innocent bystander, it's murder. And it's upsetting how ingrained murder is in our conflict into our world. So, I'd like to bring you back to that rock, paper, scissors analogy I gave you before. I'm assuming it's not sitting well with you, because hey, this is just a childhood game. Like one does, I was on the internet one day and I stumbled across this rather interesting theory about that gave a new meaning to this game. And I believe this one is far more constructive than the one I gave you. So, rock crutches, scissors, scissors cuts paper, and paper smothers rock. But hang on a second. How can something as flimsy as paper defeat the might of a rock? But what if? What if paper represents the written word, the intellectual thought, and, and the rock represents the physical power? Basically, it's mind over matter. It even brings to mind the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. So what do we do about this secret truth of war? We stop and we rethink. We can start by rethinking the way we perceive war in the media. There's this idea that war is romantic, that it's exciting and adventurous, and our films focus on that adventurous side of it. But we need our filmmakers to realize and remember that in reality, war is much more darker, much more sinister, and much more tragic. We need to be thinking about what we are showing on millions of screens around the world, because what's showing on those screens is flowing out into our culture. It's affecting our children's war games in the backyard, their action figures, and their video games as well. We need to be thinking about what type of message we are sending our next generation. We could even think about the way we teach students about, about war. For example, in Japan, Japanese society has completely reconsidered the way that they perceive war. In university, you can't just take conflict studies. You need, you need to take peace and conflict studies. So since 1945, Japanese society has completely like rethought the way that they see war to only make it as a last resort. We live in a truly globalized world where the power of our culture cuts across time zones and borders. We also live in a rapidly progressing world where communication is vital to our survival and the ways for how we can handle conflict are growing. So why can't we use that? What if Rather than seeing the opposing side as the opposing side, the, vil the villains, the scum, the filth, we simply saw them as people. People just like us. Our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our friends. 
It may be a long shot, it may not be a foolproof solution, but we have the power as a collective society to believe that. There are also several alternatives to war that our government could use, from increasing the focus on peace and negotiation and mediation, to peacekeeping bodies and treaties, and to looking at the power of conversation, but without physical threat. I read this, re this really interesting article in Foreign Policy magazine a while ago, questioning why we don't approach war, peace I mean, with the same effort, resources, and practicality that we do for war. So we need to reintroduce peace as a, not just an idea, but a practical policy option. To do this, we need new voices and expertise at the table to address the fuels of violence. Because we need our leaders to understand that, non, that political, non-violent unrest are far, far more beneficial than the violent ones. So if our mindset could be cha changed to view peace as achieving economic, social, environmental, and political goals, and war simply as a tool for destruction, crime, and tragedy, Think how soon wars fall out soon, soon fall out of being commonplace. But we also, not, we, need, we also need to start rethinking. I ask you to rethink what you have been taught. War is not the only avenue of achieving peace, and we should not be accepting that it is the only option. Thank you.